If you're a PC gamer that's seen any of my other HP Omen pre-built gaming PC reviews, then you may have noticed that typically they offer great price to performance ratios. But there's one popular pre-built that I have not yet reviewed. Does this one follow that trend as well? In this video, I'm going to give you my honest and unbiased review of the HP Omen 40L and a bunch of its accessories. In this video, we're gonna quickly zip you through the unboxing and what's included, take you through some incredibly thorough gaming and creator benchmarks, talk about the design and build quality, the internals, thermals, fan noise, overall ease of use, pricing breakdowns, and comparing its price to performance ratios against the competition, as well as my top pros and cons. If you do get discouraged about purchasing this PC after anything that I say in this video, just keep watching, because I'm also gonna be sharing with you some alternative PCs that I recommend for every budget. I'll have links down below in the comments and description for all the computers that I mentioned. I guarantee that by the end of this video, you will know if this PC is right for you or not. But if you still have any questions after watching this entire video, just shoot me a comment. And if you're publicly subscribed, I guarantee a personal response. This configuration that I'm reviewing here for you includes the AMD Ryzen 7 7700 CPU, an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4060 Ti GPU, and 16 gigabytes of 4800 megahertz. DDR5 RAM. All right, now let's rewind back into the past and check out the unboxing. As you open the box, you'll be met with another small box. Inside that, you've got a very basic mouse that feels very light and the clicks are a little hollow and cheap feeling. We've also got a very basic, thin, low profile keyboard that has keys similar to the feel of the clickiness of a laptop. Then we've got a little Omen booklet here with some instructions that are kind of obvious. And then on the other side, we've got all the detailed information about your ports and the buttons on this PC. First up with the gaming accessories are HyperX Alloy Origins Aqua Mechanical Gaming Keyboard. Included in this box, we've got a quick start guide a braided USB cable, a pretty cool extra gamery spacebar replacement, a HyperX red keycap for that special hot key that you want to stand out. This keyboard actually has an aluminum body, but the keycaps are made of a PBT material, which is a much more robust, stronger, and longer lasting plastic than ABS. This is definitely one of my favorite keyboards when it comes to the feel of the keys and the overall comfortability, but we're gonna talk about functionality here in a sec. Next, we've got the HyperX Cloud 3 gaming headset. This will actually work for all of the latest consoles phones with USB, and obviously PC. Overall, it is designed well and feels pretty premium, and this foam topper makes it comfortable to wear for extended periods of time. Not a very exciting amount of buttons on it, though, with just one mute button and one volume scroll wheel. The large majority of features on this headset are software-related, and we're going to check those out here in a sec. There's also a smaller box in here with a 3.5 millimeter USB-A or USB-C adapter, and your microphone attachment that just snaps into the left side. We also were sent these 3D printed headphone accessories that snapped onto the sides and gave us some cute little ears which were interesting and I'm just gonna say not really my style the last accessory we've got here is the HyperX Pulsefire Haste 2 wireless mouse which also works on all of the latest consoles except for the Nintendo switch I do like the simple and smooth white design but at first the extreme lightweightness of it was throwing me off once I placed it down and started using it though that material that they used on the feet made this thing just glide like butter the clicks were solid and responsive as well. They also included these little optional stickers for it, which I obviously had to try out. It gave them a nice grip, which I really like, so I kept them on, even though I think it makes it look a little less appealing. Also in the mouse box, we got a cable that could be used as a charging cable when your mouse is in wired mode, or an extension for closer proximity to the wireless adapter for the best feedback. Now for the HP Omen 32Q gaming monitor.
At first glance, I'm liking the look of it. Just kind of looks like it belongs with this computer. These are all of the stats for the monitor, and so far the picture looks pretty good, but we're gonna dive more into that later in this video. Design-wise, this PC is very similar to that HP Omen 45L that we've reviewed in the past, just somewhat of a step down in size and style, both functionally and aesthetically in my opinion. No cryo chamber like the 45L had, but we also have a less powerful CPU, so not as necessary in this case. On the front, we've got that signature glowing logo that we've seen on the others. This front panel is pretty easy to take off if you want to remove the front dust panel for increased airflow. Behind that panel reveals that we've got a spot for a third intake fan on the front. And then at the top, we've got enough room for a 240 millimeter radiator two fan combo if you plan to upgrade to liquid cooling in the future. Accessing the internals is pretty easy on this model as well. All you need to do is press this internal access button on the top and then pop off the side glass panel. Right here, we've got our heat sink fan combo over our CPU for removing the heat. And then to the right of our CPU, we've got our two sticks of Kingston Fury Beast RGB DDR5 RAM that can comfortably reach 5200 megahertz with XMP enabled. And underneath that, our NVIDIA GeForce RTX 4060 Ti GPU. Nothing that special about this design, pretty basic. Behind that GPU is our main SSD, which is a one terabyte Western Digital. This one, understandably, with about 30% lower speeds than the top tier PCs that we normally review. Almost five gigabytes per second read and 3.4 write. Then looking at the motherboard a little closer, you can see we've got another slot for an additional SSD if you need even more high-speed storage. And thankfully, this one is accessible without removing the GPU, which is always nice. If you plan to be doing any streaming or recording of your gameplay with a capture card, we've got an extra available PCIe slot here at the bottom for that. Then swinging around to the back and removing that panel reveals some not too clean cable management, two additional two and a half inch SATA SSD bays, and then at the bottom for yet even more storage, two more slots for traditional 3.5 inch mechanical hard drives. And then lastly, in the bottom right, we've got HP's proprietary non modular 80 plus gold 600 watt power supply. Basically with non-modular, if you ever plan to upgrade your PSU or just need to replace it if it fails, it's going to take just a little bit longer since you have to rerun all your cables. For the ports on the top, we've got a headphone microphone combo jack, a dedicated microphone jack, four USB ports, and your power button. On the back, a microphone, audio out, and audio in, two more USB ports, and an RJ45 Ethernet jack, a USB-C port, four more USB-A ports, and one more USB-C, and then on the back of our 4060 Ti GPU, one HDMI port, and three display ports. So jumping into the software for HP Omen gaming PCs, what you're going to use the most is something called the Omen Gaming Hub. Here we've got a nice dashboard showing you all of your current live stats for your CPU, GPU, and RAM usage. Overclocking lets you enable XMP for faster RAM without having to enter the BIOS. Network booster for prioritizing your internet connection for whatever apps or games that you prefer. Under lighting effects, you've got a pretty decent amount of cool looking RGB animations or or even basic solid colors if you prefer a more simple look. You can also pull your PC and accessories into Omen Light Studio and arrange them how they actually are on your desk so that everything is perfectly in sync and flows seamlessly from one to another. That performance tab though is where the magic happens. Crank that power mode to performance and that thermal mode to turbo when you're ready for the best gaming experience. Quiet mode is good for when you just need some silence and aren't really doing anything that's that intense. We'll talk about fan noise here in a sec. You can also manually control your fans if you maybe just want to crank everything up to full speed. For those of you that like to get into more advanced overclocking within the BIOS, you're kind of out of luck with this one as the BIOS for HP desktops like this one is pretty slim pickings as you can see here. We were also able to control the Omen 32Q gaming monitor that HP sent us within the Omen gaming hub as well. Pretty similar controls to what you had using the joypad on the back but with bigger and better visuals which I actually prefer. This sample image right here demonstrates really well how much of a difference this HP Enhance Plus option makes. Setting this to high makes every Everything looks super crisp and really detailed in games. After running all of my tests on this monitor, the results confirmed it had great contrast and color accuracy. Gameplay was pretty smooth with that 165 hertz refresh rate and as expected, playing back that UFO test in slow motion revealed very little motion blur. Turning off all the lights while playing a black video did reveal a tiny bit of light bleed on the edges, but that's kind of a panel to panel luck of the draw kind of thing that really isn't that noticeable when playing anything other than a black screen. It's also got a pretty nice range of motion with a pivot of 90 degrees in both directions, which will allow you to go vertical if you want, negative five degrees to 20 degrees of tilt, and a height adjustment of 100 millimeters. It is priced well too, but I'm still spoiled with those Alienware and Corsair Xenion OLED widescreens that I reviewed. Those are by far my favorites. For that extra level of control for your accessories, you're going to want to download the HyperX Ingenuity app. For the keyboard, we've got a nice preview of what all of our animated effects are going to look like, and these triggered effects right here are really cool 
tool for those of you like me who like lighting to respond to your typing. This is also where you can assign different hotkeys for your personal preferences. Similar lighting animations and triggered effects for the mouse buttons as well. Unfortunately, only the scroll wheel has any lighting on it for the mouse though. And then also just like the keyboard, we've got some custom options for assigning actions to any of the buttons. For the HyperX headphones, just some basic settings for the volume and microphone. Unfortunately, I could not get mic monitoring to work with this headset. And that's a huge bummer for this headset because a lot of people want to hear what they sound like. This is what the HyperX Cloud 3 headset sounds like with the 3.5 millimeter audio jack. And this is what the exact same headset sounds like with the USB adapter. As you can hear when we had the headset plugged into the adapter first and then through the USB-C port, it sounded a lot better than the crackly results we got when plugging it straight into the microphone jack. I tested all of the equalizer presets while listening to music, and I must say that the sound quality is fantastic when using the bass boost preset, and even more so with DTS-X spatial sound enabled. But overall, I'd have to say that the lack of mic monitoring is a deal breaker for me. I'll post an update if that ever starts working. When it came to the fan noise, these are my results after testing each of the main fan profiles. In quiet mode, we got 40.9 decibels. And then when moving up to performance mode in gaming, it brought the fan noise up to about 41.7 decibels. This is impressively quiet, and as you can see, it almost tied for the quietest pre-built that I've ever reviewed. For the thermals, in this thermal imaging time-lapse from PC off to full-on gaming, you can see that we start to get that typical accumulation of heat on the side of the glass where the GPU is. And then removing that side panel gives us quite a bit more detail of what's going on here. Definitely a large portion of the overall heat is coming from the GPU, but even more so right there above the CPU. Moving around to the back shows it a little more clear in that area, but overall since neither the CPU or GPU are pushing that much power, the back exhaust fan and top vents seem to be sufficient enough in releasing that heat. The large majority of our thermal testing was spent in actual gameplay though. These were our CPU and GPU temps for several different games at 1080p. Overall, I'd say I'm satisfied with how cool this PC stayed, the hottest game being Call of Duty Black Ops 4, and even that one averaged out to only around 71 degrees. Compared to all of the other recent pre-builds that I've reviewed, it was about average. If you put a more powerful CPU or GPU in this case though, then you'll want to also upgrade that cooling. You can see that some of the larger top tier PCs with i9s and 4090s were actually cooler than this one because of the more advanced cooling they come with. Similar results on our average GPU temperature comparison chart with it surprisingly running hotter than all of the 4090 PCs that we've tested. Still nothing to worry about though, it does have sufficient cooling because an average of 57.6 degrees Celsius is really not that bad. All right, performance and gaming benchmarks. This is the second most important part of this review. The most important is the price to performance ratios, and we're going to get to that here in a sec. For Cinebench R23, which simulates its 3D rendering power, we got a multi-core score of 17,680 and a single core score of 1884. This shows this budget PC to be on the lower end compared to most of the PCs that I've reviewed in the past year. Another very helpful test for you 3D renderers is the V-Ray benchmark, and these were our CUDA RTX and overall V-Ray performance scores. You can see that next to the CyberPower PC that we were reviewed with the same GPU that this PC was just a hair below what that PC could do. This is an important score if you're doing a lot of high polygon 3D modeling or real-time viewport rendering and lighting. That overall V-Ray performance score though is a CPU based rendering test and this demonstrates how well a PC can handle the more advanced realistic rendering that takes a lot longer to calculate. This score showed that the CPU in this computer could render about halfway between what one of our other pre-builds with a 13th gen Intel i7 and i5 could do. For those of you 3D renderers that use Blender. Here we got a CPU score of 248 and a GPU score of 3981. Pretty similar results as the V-Ray benchmarks when it came to comparing the other GPUs. And then in the CPU comparison chart, again right there in the middle between the i7 and i5 pre-builds. And the last set of benchmarks for creatives before we get into gaming are the Puget benchmarks. For DaVinci Resolve we got 2197 which proved to be closer to i5 territory. Adobe Premiere 8209. Obviously lower than the higher tier PC that we tested. And since Puget changed the way that their test works, we can't fairly compare all the older reviews below to the higher tests at the top, just basically to each other, if that makes sense. Adobe Photoshop 7082. Again, compare the performance of the top group to each other and the bottom group to each other separately to understand which one did better. For 3D Mark, which is a great benchmark used to predict a computer's overall game ability, we got an overall score of 13,291, a graphics score of 13,676, and a CPU score of 11,000. 
10,466. Seemingly low here as well, even amongst other similar spec PCs. But we're gonna see how that all factors into the pricing here in a sec. Actual gaming benchmarks are probably what you guys care the most about though. And this right here is a preview of some of that gameplay. This chart right here is the result of a lot of testing. It's gold in giving you the most accurate overall info on how this PC performed at three of the main graphics presets. It is nice that even at ultra presets with Cyberpunk 2077, you're looking at almost 100 FPS. And averaging all of the gaming FPS together and putting it up against all of the most recent PCs that we've reviewed, this gives us an even better overall perspective on how it stacks up against the rest. You can see it's just barely behind that similar spec CyberPower PC with an i7 and 4060 Ti. Is it fairly priced against that PC though? Or any of the other budget gaming PCs? It'll cost you $1,500 at Best Buy and $10 less than that through HP directly. And in our master price to performance chart, we can see that as of right now, it gets barely beat by several lower spec CyberPower PCs, as well as a SkyTech Azure 2 and an iBuyPower Slate Mesh. So basically this reveals this PC to be a little higher than it should be right now. If you're a little unconvinced to buy this PC after this review or locked into a lower budget, or maybe even can actually afford more, then these are my recommendations for every budget. I've also got links down below in the comments and description for all of them. At just over $3,300, the Alienware Aurora R16 is actually a pretty good deal. I would only get this one if and only if you don't plan to be upgrading to next gen components. Alienware PCs are only for those that find modifying their PCs to be a chore and basically just toss their PCs for a new one after a few years. If you need to be under $3,000, I would go with this i7-480 version of the CyberPower PC Gamer Supreme for just over $2,600. Basically the same specs as the less expensive version of this i7-400 we tested, but $400 cheaper. Although I prefer the Corsair version, this one is a good version if you can't afford Corsairs. The quality isn't as good as Corsair pre-builds, which also come with a two-year warranty versus the typical one year. But honestly, subscribing to Best Buy's Total Tech membership will give you an even better two-year coverage than that one. No Best Buy does not pay me to say that. I have it myself and I've loved it. If $2,600 is still too much for those with a budget closer to $2,000, the SkyTech Azure 2 with a 4070 Ti that I reviewed is what I recommend. Closer to a $1,500 budget, if you're less than impressed with this HP Omen 40L that I reviewed today, then I would get this version of the Lenovo Legion Tower 5i with a 4070. Closer to 1,000, this CyberPower PC Gamer Extreme that I reviewed with an i5 and 4060. And for under 1,000, this exact version of the Victus by HP 15L that I reviewed with a 1660 Super and i5 for just a little over $600. That's the bare minimum that I would recommend for semi-decent gaming though. If you're coming from a console like an Xbox Series X or a PS5 and you want your graphics to at least match that, then you'll need a PC with at least a 3060 or in this case a 4060 GPU and 16 gigabytes of RAM, which brings the price of this one up to about $800. Overall, this is a pretty inexpensive and decently powerful gaming PC with a nice design and it's almost the quietest that I've ever tested. I can stand by and recommend this one. And if you do decide to purchase this one or any of the others that I mentioned, then please remember to use my affiliate links in the comments and description below as I get a small commission at no cost to you for every single purchase made. And it's actually a major factor in keeping this channel going and getting better and better for you. I'd also like to personally thank all of my members for their monthly support of this channel. Also make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with notifications turned on to stay up to date with all of my latest tech and gaming PCs. Thanks for watching guys. I love you guys. God bless.